So first of all, let me tell you the nice service we can learn from that. Especially Martin Martinez and Max Deardorf for calling my attention to this event and for bringing us in. So the title of my presentation is Lies in the Angry World, the Inquisitorial Corruption and Prison Codes of Alleged Crypto Jews in Lima in the 1600s. The topic of corruption has recently received scholarly attention. In a collective volume published in 2016, Ruder and Rosen Müller write that in order to place corruption, as a subject of historical inquiry, we should consider the presence of three elements. First, the existence of qualified norms for turning a public post. Second, the abuse of that public post, either disobeying or disregarding the norms. And third, the presence of a debate documenting such abuse. As I will explain today in my readings of materials from the Lima Inquisition, I find these three elements indicating corrective behavior of Inquisition officers. And I also find that by analyzing what the Inquisition considered corrective behavior, I can open a window to understand prisoners' actions and reflect about their strategies and secret codes. Following regulation, when members of the Lima Tribunal noticed some wrongdoing, they conducted inspection, visitas. If they discovered that the tribunal member had been obstructing activities in any way, the institution had to conduct it. A criminal trial, even than the trial of faith, addressing the issue. In addition to document institutional corruption, these sources unveil for us how prisoners benefited from that, left by uh, organizational practices of the tribunal, used the knowledge of tribunal procedures, and deployed some level of agency to include in their trials of faith. In addition to visitas, this type of information can be found in other sources. Trials of faith, criminal trials, trial summaries, correspondence between tribunals, correspondence between a local tribunal and the Supreme Council in Madrid. Different tribunal officers, such as prison guards, defense lawyers, African slaves, are mentioned as those who assist the prisoners and enable their strategies. Finally, prison, prisoners who had experienced prior trials of faith whether in Lima or in other locations, had knowledge of inquisitorial regulations and secret procedures, so they could be shared this information in the brief. In this presentation, I am collecting information from primary and secondary sources while expanding on ideas suggested in my book, uh, of the Lima Inquisition. I aim to explore the connection between corruption and an agency, and I try to understand how prisoners confront their power and authority from within. I organize my ideas around three main hubs. One is corruption, the other one is strategies, the third one is prison of prison codes, and at the end I offer some reflections, some final reflections, because this is still work in progress. The first corruption. General regulations indicated that inquisitors have to conduct inspections covering the entire jurisdiction. And although there is no record of the general inspection covering the entire land, there is information about inspections of the Lima Tribunal. They had to visit the prisons at least twice a month, review prisoners, uh, look at their conditions, etc. Notice of anomalies could have surfaced either in regular or occasional inspections or in criminal trials. In an article published in 1984, Spanish scholars Castaneda Delgado and Hernandez Aparicio analyzed the record of an inspection conducted in the Lima Tribunal in the late 1500s by Don Ruiz Don Juan Ruiz de Prado in which all kinds of irregularities were discovered. Even though there is information about conflicts of interest that could have imprinted some sort of bias in the documentation, I still think that the reported disputes are plausible in a general sense. I think this could have been happening inside the tribunal. There were about 200 complaints against the inquisitor. Uh, they are talking about poor, uh, inspectors discussed poor record keeping, faulty development trials, lack of required signatures, granting permission to defense advocates to see original materials instead of copies, which should not have happened, allowing advocates to take these materials to their homes, which should not have happened, or even worse, to the secret cells, sharing these materials with the prison. Unfairness in sentencing in both directions. Inspectors also found that prisoners in the secret cells had scissors, knife, money, paper, and even access to properties that had been confiscated from them. None of this was allowed according to regulation. Prisoner servants, from the, from the outside, circulated in and out of the prisons, sometimes 
going against the idea of the trial of faith in which the heretic or the alleged heretics were supposed to be isolated and in secrecy thinking about what, what the trial of faith was about. Examples from other tribunals demonstrate that Lima was not an exception. Scholars have been documented this issue. Grievances from some 20 prisoners exposed the poor quality of the attention they received and also complained about the inquisitor and the tribunal secretary. Inquisition tribunals, uh, <clears throat> uh, although, do sorry, although documented at a different moment, a similar picture emerges from transgressions of Lima tribunal members at the lower rank, as I will discuss later on. Inquisition tribunals usually operated in a compound that had three sections. One section for the tribunal, one for the prisons, and a chapel. The section for the tribunal included hearing rooms, storage of records, torture chambers, and uh, lodging for at least one inquisitor. <coughs> the reason is that in this, uh, in this way, the inquisitor could be available at, at any moment if a prisoner decided to confess. By the same logic, having the prisons in the same facility facilitated internal movements. Uh, prisons, uh, from the prisons to the hearing rooms, all the photo chambers, all to consult records. So no one from the outside could see what was going on or the condition of the prisoners as the trial law. The person in charge of prisons and prisoners was the alcalde, alcalde de la cárcel secreta, the steward of the secret prisons. And he was assisted by uh, our other members of the tribunal. He was a low rank official who usually lived close to the cells, had responsibilities over the prisons and prisoners. He was responsible for the presentation of the safety of the prisoners, but also for the preservation of the secrecy in, uh, attached to the tribunal, to the trial section. Alcaldes were not authorized to discuss the development of the trial with prisoners or with anyone else. Instructions from the 15 and 1600s established that Alcaldes were going to visit the cells at the beginning and in end of each day, verify the well-being of the prisoners, make sure the cells had no openings that would enable the exchange of our prisoners uh, to um, complete the court, the chores, guards had to lock oneself before moving on to the other one. If anyone needed scissors or knives, this had to be used in front of the guard and then taken away. As I said before, I think that by looking at corruption, I can open a window and explore prisoners' agency, what is that they were doing. For example, in the 1630s, the Lima Tribunal conducted almost 100 trials of faith for the heresy of crypto Judaism, the one that is known as the Complicity, the Great Complicity. This affected many Jews of Portuguese descent who lived in Lima, most of whom received punishment in the 1639 Auto de Fe, in which 11 of them were burned at the stake. Almost at the same time, the Lima Tribunal conducted a criminal, a criminal trial against the steward, the Alcalde de las Carceres, Bartolomé de Pradera, and his trial continued after the general auto, so he was not punished at the same time. He was separated because of the trial. He has been in this position since 1615, so in the 30s he was accused. He was separated from the functions and replaced by someone else. Following the record, Planeta's performance was questionable due to many transgressions. So these are probably at a lesser scale than what I mentioned for an inquisitor, but still brings information to what was happening in the prison. So the detail is really long, so I just summarize here a few. Uh, leaving doors unlocked so prisoners could talk and share information. Allowing servants to bring food and messages into the prisons. Receiving food, clothes, wine, and other gifts brought to prisoners uh, by families, giving them only a few items and presumably keeping the rest for himself or for his friends. Discussing trials with prisoners and offered input on how to handle them. Listening to inquisitors' meetings through a window, uh, they talk about moving a certain, moving a desk, to climb the desk and then to listen. Telling guards and prisoners of upcoming developments. Allowing some Lima residents who had expressed concern about specific uh, prisoners, allowing them into the prisons to see how the prisoners were doing. And uh, finally, relieving names of prisoners while secret trials were still underway. So, and uh, the members of the Great Complicity in different parts of the trial of faith, they do admit that they are sending and receiving messages through Pradera and through his helpers, and they're bribing him, they're paying him for this service. 
A second hub that I see is about individual and collective strategies. So Christian has identified loopholes in procedures and regulations, uh, and one example is the case of Juan Vicente. Vicente was a Portuguese man who endured three trials of faith for the heresy of crypto Judaism, each under a different tribunal. One in Ebora, in Portugal, where he was reconciled in the 1580s, the second one in Lima, in Peru, where he was also reconciled in 1612, the last one in Cartagena, in what today is Colombia, where he was released, he was burned at the stake in 1626. During Vicente's second trial, this is the one in Lima, the tribunal requested information to Ebola and then tried to confirm the first trial. The relevance of this confirmation is clear if we know, uh, and I'm trying not to provide a lot of uh, regulations of the Inquisition, but sometimes they make sense to bring them in. Uh, there is a regulation stipulating that after reconciliation, the reconciliation then gives the person a second chance. So in case of a relapse, uh, the relapse, the second trial, will probably receive a sentence of death of the state released release to the second arm. So once confronted with this information, Vicente argued in front of the tribunal that, that, that it, this, the Lima tribunal, the Lima trial, could not be labeled as a second trial, calling the attention uh, to matters of procedure. He said that the trial in Ebola, he acknowledged the existence, but he said that the trial in Ebola started as a spontaneous confession and not as a trial triggered by the tribunal. So there is another regulation that is that someone who spontaneously confesses in front of the Inquisition is not the same as of someone who has a trial triggered by the tribunal. He also said that he had not received the support of a curador uh, as, an, as Inquisitorial regulations request in case of minors appearing in front of the tribunal. And in this case, it was because he was younger than 25, that was the age that was requested. There is record, however, if you find all the information, uh, there, there was, uh, there is record of the curador, but it was a portero, it was not an advocate from the trial, but someone acting as the curador uh, in Vicente's trial. So, uh, but the tribunal still reconciled him in Lima, that then he ended up third time. Another example of individual strategies can be seen in the manipulation of the trial of faith itself, something that has already been seen by uh, scholars for other tribunals. Without, again, without going into too much detail, uh, there is a regulation that says that if a prisoner confesses, uh, whether it's spontaneous confession or in the corporal chambers, 24 hours after, they, he or she, they have to ratify the confession. The confession is read for the prisoner and they have to confirm it. So if it's ratified, then it, states, uh, it is stated as truth and the trial goes on. But if the prisoner said that recants or retracts the confession and says this is not what was going on, then the trial goes back and they still have to establish truth. So here I have some examples. In Lima, Rodrigo Valle Pereira, he's also part of the uh, network of uh, Portuguese merchants. He was imprisoned and has had his first hearing in August 1635, received the accusation in November, confessed in April after receiving the admonition or threat of torment but not torment, and ratified his confession. Later on, in January of 1637, Valterega recanted most of the confession, mainly the sections that implicated others, and he said that he lied because he was afraid uh, of uh, torture. The tribunal issued an accusation in which he denied everything, and then they issued a sentence and sent him to the corporate chapters. He was tortured and he confessed, and afterwards the tribunal uh, gave him a sentence of reconciliation, second chance. However, Vice Pereira changed his declaration once again, and in 1639, two years later, the tribunal modified the sentence to release to the secular arm, in this case, execution. A similar example can be found in the trial of Manuel Enriquez, a man who, like Joan Vicente, had a first trial in Portugal, but a second trial in Lima. In Lima, Enriquez changed the contents of his declaration several times. At some point, he pretended to be insane, and again, there is a, uh, there is a regulation of the Inquisition that someone who's proved as insane cannot be released to the secular arm that would be sent to the hospital uh, and not punished. Uh, he confused the tribunal and delayed the sentence, but he was released to the secular arm in 1664, that's almost 30 years after the beginning of the trial. More information comes from other documents of the Lima Tribunal. Uh, so, according to uh, 
the inquisitors, delaying the sentences was indeed the prisoner's goal. The Portuguese Christians wanted to postpone, and this comes from their letters, the resolution of the trial, trying to obtain a general pardon, similar to the one that was issued in 1605, so now we are in the 1630s. Finally, secret codes. Uh, the archives of the uh, the Council of Secretas had assistance from maids and slaves and also from inmates that are held in the prisons for minor offenses. The Inquisition is more lenient with them. In letters between inquisitors and the Supreme Council in Madrid, they refer to slaves who carry messages between prisoners in and out of the prisons. Sometimes spoken messages, sometimes messages written on small pieces of paper printed with ink that was prepared with lemon, with lemon juice. So here I have some examples. In a hearing, Manuel Bautista Perez, this is the leader of the Portuguese Christian community, admitted that he had corresponded with his brother in law, Sebastián Duarte, who was also in the prisons, by writing notes on small pieces of paper, papelicos, written in a numerical code and carried out by Pradera's slaves. Pradera was their target. The tribunal intercepted the messages, but they were unable to decipher the code, but they still talked to him. So he said that he received the code from the outside through slaves. And he said that they were trying, you know, they were offering comfort to each other, but they were also telling each other who they had denounced. And at some point, they are saying that they are plotting to denounce all Christians who they know, so they will be brought into the cell. However, these types of exchanges are not, do not always bring a better, a good outcome. For example, in the 1630s, from the Lima prisons, Jorge de Silva contacted his brother Juan. The latter was not in prison at that moment. Jorge sent a message exhorting Juan to appear in front of the tribunal with a self-denunciation, which I said before, that will give him a legal treatment. Juan followed the advice of his brother, but in the end, Juan's trial did not have a light sentence. He refused to confess that he ended up uh, being burned at the stake, released to the secular arm, where the brother, who from the inside called it, the one, was reconciled, and they were both sentenced to the same outcome. Considering communication among several prisoners, uh, correspondence uh, from the Lima Inquisitor from the Suprema talks about uh, on occasions the prisoners, this is translation from a source, use storms to knock, signaling, uh, signaling one for A, two for B, and so on. And when they arrived at the letter they wanted to use for the communication, they rang a bell, and that's how I translate it into English. In Spanish, it's a filler or dictator, some sound like this. And so the person who was listening, uh, could write on the floor or on the wall and put together the information. Uh, these references to this method of communication also appear in the accusation brought against Manuel Enriquez, the one who was uh, 30 years in the cells, and he is considered the responsible one, uh, that uh, the one who taught the trick to uh, to the prisoners. So. As a final reflection, what I want to say is that putting together corruption, individual strategies, assistance of slaves, and use of secret codes, we see how these Portuguese new Christians and alleged crypto Jews build alternative channels of communication and shared information for their own benefit. The information obtained through these channels allowed them to deploy individual and collective strategies during the trial of faith and to some extent challenge inquisitorial authority from within, during the, even during the trial. And a final note is that Lima was not the only tribunal to experience corruption, wrongdoing, and a variety of prisoner strategies and the use of secret codes. Prisoners exploited all factors, defied the alienation, isolation, and secrecy of the Inquisition by devising their own strategies and communication codes, and successfully manipulated the duration, although not the outcome, of many of their trials. Thank you very much.